It's like if Justin Bieber was also an Olympic athlete, you know? <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. I find that there are similarities though. One taught me the the what you put in is what you get out. The work equals improvement. Sometimes you sort of just have to jump off the deep end and then find your feet once you're out there. You never gonna feel ready. My first race back was terrible. Failure isn't failure, really. Failure are just... It's information. Thank you for inviting me into your beautiful home. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's an good honor to have to you here. You. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I've been following you for a while now, and it's been quite a, uh, a, a kind of dramatic unfoldment in so many unique and interesting ways that I want to explore with you today. So you, you're of that generation where you start as a very young kid sharing your songs online, right? Like originally on MySpace. Yeah. That's how it all started. And then eventually YouTube. I was literally discovered on MySpace, <laughs> which is crazy to think about now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and YouTube, but, but I was posting like songs I was writing when I was 11, 12, like on MySpace music. And that was, that was where I was initially contacted by a producer in the States. Mm -hmm. um, How old were you? Uh, 12, when I was first like contacted. I didn't go, ended up going over there till I was sort of 13 and then um, 14 when we moved. Uh, but originally I was 12 when, when I started to see some kind of get viewership and all that stuff. And I just had started for fun because I saw people were doing it. Mm -hmm. I saw kids were doing it. I saw um, people just posting these handy cam videos of them playing and singing, uh, singing and playing guitar. Um, and this is sort of all well understood now. I mean, that's what happened with yeah, Justin. Right? Yeah. I think so it, he was like the first, with Mendes, first one. Even, right? Like, yeah. so there's a, now there's sort of a tradition and a track. Now it's kind of like the only way you, right. you are, are, are seen, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more, um, democratized now in the way that you sort of anyone can just sort of jump on and start building a fan base and right. everything which um, is cool which is cool but i was sort of at the beginning of that youtube generation of kids that went on with the guitar and got discovered mm -hmm. um and i was the first one out of australia as well um from my knowledge at least I'm, right um but uh and that, and that's sort of, I was flown over to the States and asked to sort of cut, start cutting demos and took some meetings with some labels who wanted to meet in, in New York. And I'd never been out of the country before. Mm -hmm. So it was all very new to me and I came home for, I was telling you this the other day, uh, like came home for six months, didn't really hear anything, went back to, to swimming training. Um, and then basically got a deal off on the table. It was sort of contingent on moving to the LA. Mm -hmm. Um, and fortunately enough, my parents were willing to take me over there for, I think what they thought would, would only be a little while. Um, but turned that turned out to be us relocating there full time right. once the train started moving. And you have two siblings, two younger yeah. siblings. And they right? came over with me. My, I was only 14. So my sister would have been 13. My brother was seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, so to have them do that with me and support me through that was pretty wild. Like, I don't, I don't think every family would, would, right. would do that. And I saw like my parents definitely weren't, weren't super well off or anything. Like they, they helped us get over there. And then for a while it was sort of like up to me to sort of make it happen. Right. So on some level you're supporting the family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And your, your mom was your manager, mm. right? No, no, no she wasn't. Okay. But, um, they, they were involved in the beginning, just, just making sure I was safe and all that. Like I uh -huh. wasn't getting, you know, eaten alive. Yeah. Well, you're not, I mean, you're 13, you're not going over alone. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. Um, and, but you know, we, we were all super new to the business. Like we didn't know anything. And, and, and as Australians too, you kind of like, you feel like everyone's telling the truth all the time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're, in LA, you're in these yeah, meetings they're all telling you everything you want to hear and yeah. then you realize like it's all bullshit yeah right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you realize a couple of years later <laughs> oh that was not true or <laughs> you know yeah um so you wake up to that stuff pretty quickly your parents seem like really good parents yeah you know yeah. your 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 brother is like a concert pianist yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and he's like, is he writing a, he's he, like writing a, a musical or? He's, yeah, composer? he's a very good classical pianist. Uh -huh. He is, he's now, he's just moved to London. He bought himself a one-way ticket to London. So like uh -huh. saved up for this ticket and for a few months rent and um, said, see you later to us basically. Right. Um, wanted to go and, and work in theater over there. And he's just got himself, uh, he, he'd done a lot of sort of local um, production and lighting and stage management and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and he's now working on an opera wow. on West End, mm -hmm. like this Italian opera. And he's like, gets to get dressed up and go out and move props around and do all this. And he landed himself that job within like eight weeks of being there. Um, so he was like me a lot in that way where he's just like, would go out and just mm -hmm. make, make stuff happen for himself. And your sister's like a host and does a bunch of stuff, right? Yeah, like yeah. A lot of sort of TV, right? Uh, fashion, beauty, that that right, kind right, of thing. Right. Yeah, but it's interesting that Social all three of you stuff. are kind of in the creative arts. Your parents were both athletes, swimmers. Yeah, like they they weren't like making albums and writing operas. No, you know? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's um, yeah. My my parents. Well, my dad. My dad writes music and he he oh, sings cool. and plays guitar, and oh, that's sort of go. what. That's where I got it from. I think that's mm -hmm. where we. My mom, my mom is not, not highly musical, um, but uh, they never, they never pursued any, anything of the sort in their lives. So I think seeing us all take those paths is interesting for them. Yeah, that is, um, that's wild. And so yeah. what do you, when you reflect back on how you were raised, the way in which your parents raised you, like mm. what, it, it, it feels like they must be very encouraging to pursue yeah. your dreams in whatever form that, that comes in. Like, how did they kind of support you on the day to day? Yeah. Well, when they first, when they, when we talk about us first moving over there, they said, they said that even if we came back in a few months, they said, worst case, we taught you to follow your dreams and your gut. Cause I was so passionate about wanting to go over there and mm -hmm. pursue this and take the opportunity I was given in music. So they said, worst case, we've, we've taught you that you can do that, you know? And I'm just glad they, they had an, an open enough minds to, to allow that yeah. to happen. Um, and it was good too, cause they never, they never were like pushy, even in swimming, like they never, they were encouraging, but never, never pushy, which is, right. which was good. But um, when you wanted to get back in the pool, your mom was not so. Yeah, when I wanted to get back that. in the pool, mom was mom was trying to stop me from <laughs> like, prevent me from want, doing it. You don't yeah. want to do that. Look what you're doing. You want to come back. Like she yeah. knows. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. She she knew, so she she was shocked. Um, but I think when she just saw the way I talked about it, she mm -hmm. was like, "Well, I can't stop you. I haven't stopped you before." <laughs> right. Yeah. So there, you've done so many things as an entertainer. We're never going to be able to talk about all of that, but. Um, you did, you must've been 15, like when you were, when you went on tour with Bieber. So yeah. you were like the opening act 15, for 15, yeah, when I started, yeah. I mean, that had to be bananas. Yeah, so it was only sort of uh, a year or two into being, being over high, there. Right. Um, just signed with Scooter Braun, mm -hmm. his manager. Um, the Swifties are gonna be very upset. What's, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 and he, and so I started, started working with, with him and his team and, and, and got to know Justin a little bit and, you know, who obviously at that time was sort of the biggest young act in the world. Um, and just got put on, put on tour with him for, I just, just released my first album through, right. through, um, through Atlantic, through Warner and, and pretty much jump straight on tour as his opening act for, for how did that even, that months. came together because of Scooter? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Yeah. And just, just, um, it made sense, you know, yeah. being the, I was a couple of years younger than him, but, but coming up as sort of who's another be, young, the next young artist. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so him and I sort of developed a relationship beyond that, um, ended up working on sort of playing music together and just, you know, Develop sort of a loose friendship for for a while, um, and uh, yeah, it was wild to be sort of thrust into that at that at that point. Yeah, I going from young, <laughs> six months well, prior, I was playing like shopping centers, and yeah. then like uh -huh. I'm doing doing um, arenas around the country, and we we ended up joining him on his Australia leg and and some of Europe, and so that was wild. Right. Yeah. How long were you with Scooter Braun? Uh, about 
three years, three, four years. And that was when I, I pretty much made changes to my whole situation at the same time from management to record label, pretty much asked to be let out of everything I was mm -hmm. involved in. And once um, you were with Scooter or after leaving him? After, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is what's when I, really- when I, when I went, oh, I was still with him probably for, for the first, uh, went, went independent label wise for, for about 12 months and then ended up, ended up um, changing management situation as well after that, just because I felt like I wanted a, a whole new sort of approach. It was, it was looking back on it now, I think it was a bit drastic of me, but, but at that age, it's sort of like, I almost felt sort of trapped in. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, it was a weird thing because you you like you almost feel trapped in what you've built for yourself, um, right? So Scooter Braun, you know, notorious hit maker. I'm sure he's saying to you, "Look, I know exactly the building blocks here, and I can get you to be the next Justin. Do mm -hmm. these things. Live your life this way. Here's how we're going to do it. It's all very strategic." So when you say prison, meaning the confines of like what that path was going to look like for you, as I think a, so as an artist. Yeah. Or? Well, and Scooter though was to um, to his credit, he was supportive of like the musical direction I wanted to take. I don't think he was he was necessarily pushing me into a like, cookie cutter like a boy band. Cookie, yeah, yeah. Right? He was like, yeah. I want you to you know you should play your guitar and you should mm -hmm. you know he he was sort of he was if anything pushing me in a different direction. Say to Justin, who was the you know, pop star doing, right. doing choreography and doing all that stuff. But it was more just within me that I sort of say, oh, I want a different, I don't want to be in this circle. Oh, uh, you know, and it was, it was because... more, it was more an act of just rebellion on, on my part. Cause I wasn't happy with, or, or I didn't, I felt like a different person to what everybody thought I, I was just, just, just mu music wise. Cause I mm. sort of started to grow up really fast and had a lot of personal changes. And, you know, at 15, you at at 18 19 you you start to like a lot of different things than you did when you were 15 mm -hmm. 16 and that happens pretty quickly um or at least it did for me like right. and discovered all this other music and realized i wanted to uh, sort of make big shifts from from where i was um and now i've it was almost like this pendulum swing one way and then it goes all the way the other way and then now i'm sort of in the back in the middle right and a little so less you were, like you were on Atlantic, right? You were yeah. signed to Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the decision to not continue to have a relationship with a big record label and to go independent, because I think it speaks to a larger issue around um, rights of entertainers and how you think about ownership in your own career. Like now you own your masters, right? Like. Is that true? Like yeah, you have, yeah. You have your, so my, you, you have control over your library now, which is very unusual. My my later catalog, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, my my stuff sort of since, not not my Warner catalog, but yeah, what I've right. done since, yeah, I have I have sort of control over what I'd like to do with that whether I, you know, keep growing it and you sort of, you know, get your own publishing deal based on you know the masters you own. I mean, I sort of co-own masters, say with my own masters say with, you know, certain collaborators that I've worked on the, 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 um, the albums with, but yeah, it's not owned by a, a, a major right. corporation or anything. And yeah. so the, that decision was about, and you know, the creative aspect aside, like just from a business point of view and the way that the music business operates, how does that, how did, like, what, how did that come about? At that point, I wasn't thinking about the, the business aspect as much. Um, I wasn't really as, as, business minded or as financially aware as I am now, um, sort of having to almost being forced to, to, especially once you do go out on your own, you sort of forced to learn how, how that all works. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, now, I get a sense of you feeling like maybe, you know, like don't hold me out to have, uh, be the guy who made like the best decision, right? Yeah, like, yeah, maybe yeah. I would have done it a little bit differently. Yeah. I can't, know? I can't say I would have done it all the uh, same way then but but but, but i think you know, long term it will it will be to your benefit yeah to have yeah those rights, but i also got to zoom out a little bit and and go and did you, and did think you about, like drop a grenade on your career unnecessarily right right yeah. sometimes i think about that yeah but but yeah, as you said before when you look back in the rear view it's like it all makes sense kind of right you know? 
the way it all unfolds. And I think I just got to keep zooming out, knowing, thinking about where I'm going in the future as a musician, it's all going to be to my benefit right. eventually to have, have ownership of a larger mm-hmm. portion of my catalog. And, um, yeah, at that point I, I wasn't really thinking about the business side of it. I was more, I was, I was concerned with the way I was viewed <laughs> and mm-hmm. creatively and as a person and all this stuff. Um, but I think now I, I feel much more comfortable within that within myself and, um, yeah, I, and also I haven't, I haven't given it a whole lot of thought lately cause I haven't really, I've, so, I've just been so wrapped up in something else. Sure. Um, but the thing is, it's always there. Like swimming yeah. can't always be there no. because there's a biological clock ticking, Yeah. but there isn't as a creative mm. and as a performer, like, you know, that when you're ready, you'll be able to devote your energy to that. You know, the, the other thing is like, you started acting, you did Broadway, you did a bunch of TV stuff. Mm. Um, so when you see, uh, like, I don't know, like when you see Timothy Chalamet in Dune, do you think right. like, Hey man, if I had like not taken this detour, maybe that's me. Like, do you harbor those sorts of thoughts at all? The or are you sw- just like, I'm cool, man. Like the I'm swimming, so happy. De- the swimming detour. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. are you just, are you grounded and just that convicted in what you're doing right now that that doesn't, th- those kinds of thoughts are not part of. I have, I have moments. Yeah. I have moments. You're like, that guy? <laughs> yeah. That guy's doing that? Come on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I could have done that better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I have, Be I don't know honest. about better than him, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I have moments for sure. I, they're, they're short, they're fleeting moments, mm-hmm. but, but they're there. I mean, sometimes you go, well, but I think no matter what decision you make, you're going to, you're going to wonder what the other one would have been like. Um, but I also know that I have time yeah. and that's, that's, that's what gives me comfort is that I, I've got time to, to you're doing this thing. It's go like back when Jerry Foster went to call it, you know, Yale or Natalie Port, you know, it's like, this is your version of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And I know that, I know that say, even if I stop swimming next year, like I'll, I'll be 27 and <laughs> I can, I can, yeah, you know, look at, or, or, or plan on whatever it is I want to sort of stop pursuing from then. It's, it's going to be, I think it'll just be music. I, I, that's sort of my primary interest in mm-hmm. uh, post swimming life is, is, is being a musician and touring and, and right. making records and stuff. And that's, yeah. that's not going anywhere. Yeah. And I should say, and I said this to you at breakfast the other day, like I have a special place in my heart for you know, high performers in general, we can all learn from people who are excelling uh, in their in their respective disciplines, but there's something really cool and unique about people who find a way to um, achieve legend status in a multiplicity of, of kind of specialties. Yeah. In my generation, like I'm your parents' age, yeah. I grew up in a time where you kind of had to pick, like, are you going to be an artist? Are you going to be a creative type? Or are you going to be an athlete? And like, never the twain do yeah. those two things meet. And I was talking to my daughter, who's 19, the other day, and sharing with her about Leslie and how I was going to talk to you. Yeah. And she's an artist, and she's a painter and sculptor. And she's like, Dad, it's not like that anymore. Yeah. Is that true? Do you think there's a permissiveness around <laughs> that in a way that might have been different when I was growing up? I think that boundaries have sort of slowly been disintegrating in a way like it, and I think that's due to people doing things that I think otherwise or previously weren't considered possible or, you know, um, too much to do or excel at in one lifetime. Right. Like Mm -hmm. I think, um, and that's sort of when I was jumping back in the pool was sort of one of my not motivations, but, but something that, that I found interesting that I could possibly inspire people to sort of let go of those mental constructs mm-hmm. of like, if I'm this, I have to only be this and only this forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was fun challenging that in my own life. And then also it has been fun challenging that in my own life, you know, about just, just, just seeing what's possible. That's what all this has sort of been about for me is just seeing what's possible. Mm-hmm. And, and then also hopefully it, it, um, inspiring other people or at least challenging their ideas about what's possible too, you know? Were you very 
conscious of that when you made that decision? Or is that something that kind of percolated up in the process of, of you getting back in the pool and exploring that? It, I think it happened in the process. I think that me getting back in the pool was just that I felt like I couldn't stay away from it anymore and had this burning desire to do mm -hmm. it. Um, and just like the whole thing was about the what ifs were going to be too much for me in the future to, to not have a crack and, 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 and to live with those regrets or, or what ifs of not having tried. Um, and then, and then when I started and things sort of started to, to develop and, and, and progress, I realized I sort of became a little bit more self-aware about what I was actually doing. And when I started to realize that I didn't have anyone to look to, to, or a blueprint to follow about how it was, how it should be done, realizing that no one in swimming had really ever done that before. Um, you know, people had sort of won or made the Olympics and then like won again, 10 years later mm -hmm. after having a bunch of time out, like, you know, an Anthony Irvin or right. these guys that had these super interesting stories, but they kind of stopped at a super high level or at the top and then kind of like mm -hmm. took a bunch of years off and then came back, got back to the top. Um, whereas I don't think anyone sort of stopped young at like an age group level and then decides 10 years later to, to try and, uh, make that elite level. Yeah. There's, there's no blueprint. There's no precedent. Nobody has ever done that before. Uh, I remember when Pablo Morales jumped back into the pool, like he's my mate, he's my yeah. buddy. I went to law school with him. Uh, we swam together at Stanford. He was two years older than me. Um, he's an OG man. He, he Watching was, him with no cap and goggles, like I know, no goggles, no cap. <laughs> you know, old school, yeah. almost like Mark Spitz, you know, style. Yeah. Winningest uh, NC2A swimmer ever. Uh, was sort of anointed to be this extraordinary Olympic champion, and I think he kind of overtrained. Um, that mm. was at '88. Was it Seoul where he he didn't shockingly he didn't make the team? Right. Even though going yeah. into that Olympic trials, he was favored to just, you know, take everything Yeah, and hung it up, went to law school. We finished law school together. We studied for the bar together. And then he got, he got back into the pool and then did what he did at the following Olympics and shocked everyone. And that was at yeah. the time, like super radical and thinking back, like how old was he? He wasn't that old. He would have only been what, early twenties still. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe mid twenties, 29, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Which was was old then. Super for old. Swimming. Super old. People because there was no money younger. in the sport at that yeah. time. And so when you finished college when you were twenty one, that was it. Yeah. Nobody progressed beyond that. Now it's very different. And to your point, yes, Anthony Irvin, there's a few others, um, at the peak of their powers, took a break or stepped down yeah. and then made a comeback. But you stopped at thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> and you were very successful as a thirteen year old but it was unclear how far that was going to go. Yeah, right? It wasn't yeah. like you were on a Michael Phelps track, like you were winning state championships and you were probably like top in your age group. Right? Yeah. What like, was it like? Yeah. And I suppose there's, there's a lot of, you know, countless swimmers that are good young and then you never hear of them again, right? right. They may be good until they're 16 and then disappear mm -hmm. or, or whatever. I mean, I was, um, yeah, like I was winning sort of national age group titles there for a few years in a row, particularly in, in, in butterfly and freestyle events. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, but, but that, you know, that, and obviously that's an indicator of, I suppose, you know, Promise. some, some level of talent yeah. or feel for the water or whatever you want to call it, but you know, it's not necessarily a guarantee, you know, you're going to grow up to, you know, make your national team or, mm -hmm. you know, go and compete at that level. So, um, I suppose coming back to it, like I, it's, it's funny thinking back now to kind of like the, the, the blind confidence that I had coming back into it when not really realizing, I think that the mountain I was, you know, undertaking, trying to climb. Um, now a lot of people, you know, was sort of met with a lot of, are you sure? So, you know, even mm -hmm. from my own mom and who, who swam for Australia and right. sort of understood like Both your parents were what it took yeah. at a high level. And I think she was sort of like, you know, you've got this, you've built this life for yourself in the last 10 years. You sure you just want to like put that all aside to go and stare at the black line for, for, you know, hours a day and put yourself through, through all that. Like it's, it's grueling and 
um, I, I didn't really have any reservations about it. Just, I just knew it was what I wanted to do. Mm. And I think it's important to point out for people that are watching or listening who don't have familiarity with the sport of swimming, mm. swimming is a sport that is just all about the grind. And, um, it's very unusual for a swimmer to even take a couple months off Yeah, to take a year off. Are you kidding me? Like it's not something that people come back from when yeah. they do that. Um, and it's also a sport where you spend just years and years and years developing those years between 13 and, and 20, whatever. Right. Mm. Um, but nobody has really popped in. I missed all 22. those foundational. Yeah, you missed that. Well, what's interesting about that is, yeah. So, you didn't have any of that. You were still yeah. 13. Like usually the that's why I can't swim at 200 fly. <laughs> double workouts and all that kind of stuff starts around 14. Like that's when yeah. it starts to get hard. And yeah. so you skip that part, but you were able to pop in it. So it was like 22, 23 yeah. when you when you got back in the water. 20, 22, I was starting to um pop in every now and then a USC. Like mm -hmm. that's that's I think right. when you were talking about and Connor. Dave Salo. Dave the, with Dave Salo. There, but yeah. again, it was very much, it wasn't. It wasn't, I hadn't decided to come back yet. I was sort of like, I like to swim, you know, I'll just jump on the side here and, yeah. you know, see how it feels. And I hadn't swum at that point and probably, I hadn't probably swum more than a couple hundred meters in like nine years or something, eight <laughs> years. <laughs> um, and so I started to do that then with them, you know, when I was in town and I was still traveling a fair bit for work and then uh, COVID happened mm -hmm. and I- No touring. No touring no nothing um had already had already been simmering on this idea for quite a while probably probably since rio to be honest because i went down to rio and watched friends of mine that i grew up competing with competing in the olympics and succeeding and doing all this and it kind of i saw my old coach down there and we had like this small little chat about it about the mm. idea of it that just sort of sat with me and sparked something that simmered for for years until i couldn't take it anymore and had to start to right change not, my life it's not even <laughs> like unfinished business it's like business you haven't even begun yeah you know yeah. didn't you also perform for the queen at buckingham palace at the commonwealth games the, yeah the, the, yeah the, the, the most recent commonwealth games right it and was for you to be there and see all the athletes and there was something about that as well yeah it was the 2018 commonwealth games um torch lighting like the uh -huh. relay um and the 2018 games were on the gold coast here where we are which is where i grew up and i think because of that they uh -huh. being from the gold coast they had me go over and perform mm -hmm. and sung like i still call australia home and did all that in, in the grounds of the buckingham palace and got to meet the queen and and do all that and i think and then and then four years later i was competing in the next one as right. a swimmer so <laughs> and at that time in 2018 was yeah hadn't hadn't even really considered the idea of of swimming mm -hmm. um or, or, or really jumping back into it so it's kind of wild when i was getting up on the blocks four years later right um having known four years ago i was doing what i was doing that's, yeah that's so wild yeah. but when you're performing there as a singer songwriter thinking yeah but i'm an athlete too like nobody's seeing me as an athlete yeah and no one knows <laughs> no yeah, one, yeah 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 <laughs> no one knows that i can do this and that yeah uh -huh. and that that was i think that was a little bit part of it too it was almost like a, a thirst to prove myself knowing that it's almost like you you can say you can do all this and that as as much as you want you can say oh yeah i could have been this or i could you know mm -hmm. people people do that all the time but i i really wanted to I think proved to myself and to others that I, 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 I just yeah, wanted to were, see you were for real. About yeah. It. That I was yeah. for real about yeah. it. Cause I think people, I yeah. knew people were kind of like, yeah, but right. Well, even Dave know. Salo, didn't he say like, yeah, he told, didn't he tell Brett Hawk? Like, yeah, this isn't going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. Dave <laughs> Salo told him, yeah. um, David Marsh told him that, uh -huh. which, oh, Marsh, which, yeah, um, Marsh. yeah. And these guys are like, for people yeah. who don't know, like these are the legend coaches in the mm. sport, at least in the States. And David sort of since, David Marsh sort of has since, had since said, or at least even, even a couple months after yeah. that, he sort of said, no, you, 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 this is the second time in my life I've been proved wrong or that my, my judgment wasn't correct or, and I don't think it's that he thought that, I'm not sure. It was like, he'd said it was way back. Um, yeah. But he, but he said, um, I think it was maybe about a swimmer that he didn't think would succeed. And, 
NC2As or something that mm-hmm. ended up being quite good. And um, like Bre- Caesar, I remember Snow Brett, somebody. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Brett took me down. This was still very early. I'd only been swimming for a couple of months. Took me down to do some sort of technical stuff with David Marsh down in San Diego. And I think um, it was more that David, I think, had just said to Brett, um, are you sure this, is, you know, I think he should just stick to what he's mm-hmm. doing. Like, is he, uh, you know, too, he's had too much time out. This ship's kind of sailed, you know. Yeah. It would. It's going to take, it's not going to be possible to get to, you know, where, I guess this kid wants to go. <laughs> right. Um, and in fairness, the first time you jumped into a meet, you swam like a 51, 100 yard fly, right? Yeah. That yeah. was, and that was like before I trained or anything. It was sort of like when I was doing those little one off sessions mm-hmm. at USC and they sort of said, well, there's this little meet the invitational um, coming up. And I, I at that time was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll get in and have a go. And I was, I was so unfit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, swam horribly. Like, yeah, 51. Um, I mean, 51 would be, you know, good at a master's meet, but yeah, that's not yeah, getting yeah. you anywhere. No, not as like, not as like a 22 yeah. or 23 year old. And, um, and so that was, that was months prior to, to COVID and all that when I, it was sort of like the first time I'd raced or done anything of the sort in mm-hmm. a long time. Um, it was almost just a bit of fun at that point. But uh, I remember sitting sitting with Dave Salo actually going, I want to go 51 in the 100 long course meter fly. And he mm-hmm. kind of just, you know, I could see him smirking going, <laughs> yeah, you understand what that takes, you know? Uh-huh. And um, last year I did it. So, right. yeah. It's just yeah. like wild to to think back actually sitting here with you. You don't, I don't often do that retrospect it's type reflection. It's important to reflect back on that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it, it all happened pretty quickly also not without its lumps um mm. and 51 long course is like 51 oh right or 51 one one seven yeah, yeah i mean that's but. fucking legit dude like <laughs> and what's exciting is that to the earlier point of you in this unprecedented way jumping into the pool at a later age you and having missed that decade of the grind, yeah. most of the swimmers at the highest level who all of them endured that decade of grind are now trying to hang on like and stay enthusiastic about something that's just so hard to maintain long-term yeah. because you have to live this monastic lifestyle. And you know, when you're 24 or whatever, you pretty much know you're gonna have some gains, you put in the extra effort, there's always improvement to be had, but you're not really going to get a massive performance leap. Like you pretty much mm. know kind of where you are in the pecking order. But for you, there are no rules. Like yeah, the yeah. potential is, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of like what you're now capable of. And I know you're coming off a huge block this past year and you're about to, you know, compete and you're at the beginning of your taper. Yeah, And that's got to be way more exciting for somebody like you than even for Emma, your girlfriend, who's been in it for a mm. long time. Like they, they have a pretty good idea of, probably where they're going to end up. And, and, mm. and for you, I think that's just totally unwritten. It's, it's one of the mental advantages that I think I have, um, that, is that there's so much unknown still for me in the sport. And that sort of just keeps me going. Cause I go, oh, I just don't know mm-hmm. where, where I can get to, you know, maybe I've some of my fastest swims. I don't know if I have, you know, that is what it is. Right. But you, like, did, you, know, you, you fulfilled that commitment that you made. But I made to that to myself yeah. and, and I, I, you know, wanted to represent Australia and I wanted to get that, you know, we, we call it, um, our dolphin number, which is basically what the Australian swim team are called the dolphins and everyone that gets selected to compete gets a number. And so there's been, I'm number 838. So there's been 838 swimmers compete for Australia in the history of, Mm. I think it's been since, uh, 1901 or something like that. Um, and so that's something really sort of monumental and special for an Australian swimmer to get their number. And I got that last year when I went to the Com games and my mom had one. And so just sort of be able to have that together. And, um, that's something that having those little things is sort of makes me feel like no matter what happens in the future, like I've sort of have these things to show for mm-hmm. what I, what I've sort of committed to and what I wanted to prove to myself, which in a way I've done part of that already. I still feel like I have a lot more I want to do, but I'm really glad that I've been able to sort of uncover that or at least, right. at least prove to myself that 
I could kind of do what I suspected I might be able to mm. with the right with the right work and stimulus and stuff. I want to dig a little bit more into that in a minute, but here we are, uh, spring 2023. Um, what's the big meet? I mean, by the time this goes up, that meet will have passed. Yeah. But talk yeah. about like kind of where you're at now and how you're thinking about next year and Paris and the Olympics. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm almost three years into a four year journey <laughs> that I, that I embarked on. I, I, I started having only the plan to swim for four years. Um, anything beyond that is still, still unknown to me. I don't know what, what I want to do or how I feel after Paris, either the, you know, the trials or the Olympics or whatever, like kind of depends on how I go and, mm -hmm. and how I feel then. Um, yeah, but the whole plan is to be ready for 2024. So everything I'm doing is sort of with that in sight. Uh, there's a, our trials coming up in a few weeks for the world championships this year. Um, so that's sort of the next major team to qualify for in the, between now and, and, and the Olympics. Um, so do my best to get on that one mm -hmm. and, uh, everything else is kind of leading up to about right. 13, 14 months. So this from is now. still like a build year. Next year is the real yeah. year where, you know, the rubber meets the road. Pretty and, much. And the super grind starts. Um, but you've already made a Commonwealth team. You defied expectations. You got, so for people that don't know, you, in order to go to the Olympics, you have to get first or second at your trials. Yep. Yeah. Um, and third on, place. And under our um, qualifying time. Right. So if you're second and you you don't know the time, you're probably, probably not uh, going. Right. Yeah. That's not going to be a factor though. Um, but but often for, at least for the the strokes, the hundred meter strokes, they, they usually want to take two per, per event for the the relays and and this is a lot of relays now with the mixed the mixed uh men's and women's relays and all right. that so they want i think they want to you know they'll want two men for 100 fly two men for 100 breast etc right so even if you get third there's still a chance you could end up on a relay or as nah. an alternate no third's, third, third's not third going. you're out yeah okay. i third's just didn't not know going. if it was the same even here, if you're on the States. even if you're on the qualifying time which yeah. the australian qualifying times are um significantly faster than the FINA A cut times. Mm -hmm. The Australian qualifying times, they they um figure out based on what made last year's final at Worlds. So like the eighth, uh -huh. eighth, eighth time. So basically they're picking they're only taking you if they feel like you can make sort of the international right. final right. or whatever. Which is, you know, it's probably aside from I suppose the USA, it's probably the hardest swimming team in the world to mm -hmm to get on. Yeah, that's a debate. Yeah. We can have. <laughs> the Aussie versus <laughs> Aussie versus US, US that'll uh, always legendary, be legendary uh yeah, rivals. <laughs> yeah. Um so you got so you're kind of sitting in this third place position. You got third at your trials yeah. last year. You almost went to the world championships though because there was something about somebody who was going to not participate in that event, but then he changed his mind. Yeah, he ended so up, you ended doing up on it. the Commonwealth team. Yeah. Where you got yeah. fifth. Yep. But you're in the mix, I guess is the point that I'm making. But there's yeah. no guarantees either either way. There's no, a lot I'm of fast sort of guys. on the precipice yeah. of or the cusp of of qualification for uh, at least from for my events. Um, probably sitting sitting right on the cusp of them. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, there's definitely no guarantees. And yeah. do you feel that uh, that you have a leg up in terms of how you manage stress and pressure because of the things that you've done as an entertainer where you've put yourself in kind of high stress situations. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and you have like a little bit of experience, uh, that, that, that maybe, you know, allows you to handle that stuff with more calm and grace. Probably. Yeah. I, yeah, I tend, I tend to find I, I can and do thrive in high pressure, pressure situations. Um, having, as you say, the having done many different kinds of things that and, and been in many different kinds of, I suppose, high pressure situations, or at least doing things with a lot of eyeballs on you, mm -hmm. um, yeah. being up on stage being and up doing on all stage that in front of a lot of people, being in, on TV shows and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've found Broadway. that coming back into coming back into the sport, like I wasn't, I was uh, part of me had that that. Um, 
at that fear and nerve based around just being new and not having the experience and the race race experience and confidence knowing that when I did get up on the blocks, like people would be watching. Mm-hmm. Um, even at like local meets and stuff, when I first came back, I just always felt like yeah, right. eyeballs on me and stuff. Now it's, I think I've been here long enough where it's a little less, um, feel like a little less scrutinized, but uh, I was definitely prepared for that just through the mm-hmm. life experience that I've had. Vice mm-hmm. versa, do you feel that your career as a young swimmer when you were 13 and having to be in a high stress situation, even as a young person helped you when you started getting up on stages. Cause I feel like I'm here, I gave this speech the other day and I had to do it in front of a lot of people. And even though it's been many years since I was a swimmer, like it is, it it does, it felt like finals. It felt like, you know, you get up, you're a little nervous, but it's that excitement. I know what this is like. I want to perform well, et cetera. Like there's a lot of overlap, I think. Yeah. 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 I, I think that Oh, it taught me a ton as, as a kid, even just yeah, carrying that into my life as an artist and a musician beyond my swing as a young kid was prepared me for, well, one taught me the, the correlation between sort of the, what you put in is what you get out sort of mindset, the work Mm -hmm. equals success or work equal at least equals improvement <laughs> at but it's something. different in, a, in the creative um, arts you can't you can't grind a song out like no, you, you, no, it's not like doing no. a hard set like you got to be in a place of allowing and almost surrender right yeah. to like let that come in which is antithetical to the mindset of the swimmer who's like if i push hard i know i will have these gains yeah yeah i find that there's I find that there are similarities though, at least, at least from my experience, um, trying to improve as a guitarist or trying to improve as a vocalist to say, go on, to go on, um, to do theater, right? Like to do things like that. Um, things where the reps pay off. Yeah. Like where you sort of push, push, push for, for a period of time so that you can let it sort of happen when it's supposed to happen so that the, the, the second nature thing can, can happen. Like, Right. When you're, when you're, when you're racing at your peak, you're not using your brain. Yeah, exactly. You rehearsed it. So, so you can, times. you can think, 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 think so that you can not think when you, right. when you don't have to. And I think that's the same thing for, at least for performing or, or playing a, a, a song, say it's something difficult that you've been wanting to learn. Um, I was, I, I, I don't know if I, I said this at one point, if someone else did, if I heard it, but I, I like the idea that slow, like a slow growth stage will lead to a quick burst of blossom at, at the time mm. that you, many slow growth stages will lead yeah. to a quick burst of blossom. And, um, I found that that's very true for swimming. <laughs> I think yeah. when you get that breakthrough, um, you touch the wall, look at the time and you, you get that, you know, when you have that breakthrough, that time drop, you, it's like a euphoric feeling. Right. You know, and all you this, know the work that you put in to get yeah, to that and, place. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what makes it so beautiful is, is what you put in. Mm-hmm. And, and, and sort of grinding through that time to get that, to get that feeling, that reward. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing you got to figure out though, dude, you got to figure out how to go faster at finals. I know. I, I know. know. <laughs> like you, you, that's, that's a little bit of a struggle for you. That's uh, it's funny you say <laughs> that actually. You've, <laughs> yeah. you've done your research. You're good, you're good at Damn. prelims, dude, but you got to be ready that's, for the big show. Yeah. And that's something that's funny. My coach tells me that all the time. And that's something I'm working on is I'm good when I'm relaxed. Like I'll get up in the heat and go, okay, I can at least, at least nationally, like I know I can get up and go eight out of 10 and make mm-hmm. the, the final. Um, and often that swim will be faster than the one where I'm getting in and just trying to tear it. Right. You know, and it's funny swimming in that way as that counterintuitive where it's more effort doesn't always mean faster. Right. I mean, that's, that's a really important perspective, but so, I, I, I would feel that you would be somebody who would understand that better because I'm sure when you're performing music in front of a lot of people, it's going to be better when you're relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to force it or you're tensed up, it's It's going to be a stiff performance, right? Yeah. And that's, I think that's just something I'm learning with experience, at least in the pool, realizing that it it is that way. Um, But uh, I think it's going to come with, with more, you know, I'm, I'm getting up having swum say, I don't know how many, hundreds fly I've done in a race environment, maybe 
40 or 50 i'm not, I'm not sure mm -hmm. um getting up against guys who've done hundreds of them yeah i'm just sort of trying to get more of that under my belt <laughs> so i can but yeah that is something i'm working on but the mindset has to be these guys don't know like you're the question mark yeah you know and that that's like a superpower yeah yeah, yeah. You, you pretty much know what these other guys are gonna you know the range that they're gonna be in but all bets are off when you get up on the blocks yeah yeah because it's all so new absolutely and i think that's the way it was coming into last year like my my time at least coming into the the trials last year was really not not anywhere near like you you dropped from like the, a 54 to a 51 right in in about a year um was it yeah in about in about 18 months i think mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> that's i mean that's like in a hundred meter i mean that's like an astonishing you know improvement mm. for that period of time but i think going into last year trials was like 252 8 or something was mm -hmm. as quick as i'd been and i you know i knew i'd have to go 51 again on the team and when i did that in the heat i kind of showed yeah. myself i was ready to go there but this year i have to make an uh, even bigger drop so what was that like dropping back in moving back here getting back into swimming with, you know, jumping into the pool with an elite squad of guys and gals. Mm. Did they welcome you back or was there a lot of sort of <clears throat> suspicion? Like, what are you playing at? Like, come on, man. I think there was some of that. And some of, some of the people who I'm now friends with sort of, you know, said that they just naturally had those thoughts. I think mm. when I first came back, just they didn't know me. They didn't, you know, know what, really what I was doing, what my plan was. Um, so I think some people kind of, at least, at least a lot of people in the public eye and stuff, you know, thought it was like a, some kind of publicity stunt, stunt or something. Yeah. yeah. This is for, this is for the gram. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like swimming, this is not worth it for the gram. Like it takes way too much, you know, Well, that's the time. thing. It's I not mean, like you can just like pull it together in a couple yeah, of days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember like- But I, I was welcomed. I was, yeah, I was ultimate, overall well, now ultimately you, you welcomed. Well, now you swam at 51, so it's legit. But mm. at first, I would imagine there was a little bit of a acclimation period. Yeah, because yeah. when I first came back, like I, I'd, I'd obviously dropped, I'd obviously gotten to a, a decent level in a short period of time, but it's not necessarily enough to like have people say like, mm -hmm. you belong here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is different than just, uh, you know, photos of you on Instagram with your shirt off. Yeah. From, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And in fairness, like when I first got introduced to you and I, I was like checking, I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know about this. But like, <laughs> like when I look at your social media or like mm -hmm. if, if, if someone is to Google you, it's just rife with a bunch of paparazzi bullshit. You yeah. dated like, you know, some well-known women. And yeah. it's really kind of all about that. And it's easy to project or have a judgment about who you are or what's important to you based upon that. Mm. Um, and then when I met you and had breakfast with you the other day, I was like, oh, this is nothing like, like this guy in reality is nothing like I imagine based upon that kind of public persona or image, like yeah. you're very grounded, you know, conscious, kind, pretty chilled out dude. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you know? Um, so it's not surprising that you would get, yeah. you know, some of that. Is it from your experience that a lot of people that at least have been through that aren't that way or because well, I mean, you and I, I think both probably know a lot of people who have, sure. have sort of had yeah, yeah, yeah. Been shrouded in that, yeah, yeah, in yeah. that world or that. I mean, I think I'm in a unique position to talk to you because mm. I live in Los Angeles and I know a lot of the people that you've worked with, mm. uh, you know, I understand that culture. Um, but I also have the swimming background. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I can like, I have, direct experience with both of those worlds. And I would say that in general, and this is no mystery, like somebody who experiences that level of fame and attention at a young age, uh, they don't, you know, that that has a tendency to really impair your value system. Yeah. And it's intoxicating. And now that you say that, honestly, like a lot of the people that I, that I or at least a few of the people that I do know or have, have been uh, um, introduced to that, that had that uh, do have a sort of warped yeah perspective and i think in fairness from my and correct me if i'm wrong but you look like somebody who flirted with that you know it could have gone the other way yeah yeah i mean you <laughs> my were, parents will tell you, you were like i mean you were living a pretty fast lifestyle yeah absolutely and and to i reckon late teens even even early 20s i was there were moments i was caught up like i didn't know which way it was going i think my 
and my parents sort of worst nightmares of like you know young sort of pop star kid right. like going off the rails it was like coming true for them yeah, a little I mean, bit it comes true for most people in your um, situation it's the rare individual that that avoids fortunately that. for every justin timberlake to, there's you know a hundred other uh, yeah you know yeah. heroin addicts yeah you look at guys like i mean aaron carter comes to mind sure. um so there's just so many horror stories in that sense and that was I was just fortunate to, to, I, I think I owe a lot of it to my family, to my parents, you know, cause I was at least still close enough to them where I really cared what they thought. And when they, when they expressed that they felt like I was mm-hmm. losing touch a little bit, they, they, they'd bring me back to earth. Yeah. So, so maybe paint like a, a picture of that moment. You're going to clubs, you're mm. dating women that are you know very well known <laughs> you're in you have paparazzi following you around you're getting there's a lot of stuff going on man a lot of temptation it's hollywood yeah you just have access to it to mm-hmm. to way more than you should at that age and way more than and than like, this is other th- kids this is like you're you're like 19 right yeah mm-hmm. yeah younger you know 17 18 mm-hmm. start to be able to you know and, and um I was probably 16 when I started going out <laughs> there. Um, so you just, you know, all of a sudden that age, seeing Doors what you're are seeing, swinging open. it's, um, it can, as you say, be intoxicating. How um, did you kind of avoid the, the, the like drugs aspect of the whole thing? Um, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's not something I talk about much, but like, it's, you know, definitely present for, and for, for years it was, something that is just a part of being there everyone's doing it you're Mm -hmm. going out it's fun for at the beginning right Mm -hmm. um and then when it gets when it gets too much and you see it start to sort of uh, affect your personal life or affect your career like i was still actively working and doing all that stuff the whole time i was Mm -hmm. still playing music still doing gigs doing all this stuff i mean i was changing i definitely had a lot of creative and musical change from being sort of a young pop artist to wanting to be a sort of more of a a singer songwriter or play different at least become a musician i was sort of like i was very conscious of it throughout that time like wanting to set myself up as a musician and and you know i wasn't lost that stuff wasn't lost on me i sort of never really disregarded my career or anything like that but you get caught up for sure Mm -hmm. um and it's a you know what i was sort of doing then was and the lifestyle i was living then even five years ago you know as a 21 year old is a it's a far cry from where i'm at now yeah. <laughs> i'm getting yeah. i'm going to going to i'm waking up when i was going to sleep right. you know? <laughs> yeah 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 i mean it's almost like uh you've already had a midlife crisis yeah at at 20 or whatever, you know, in the biopic of your life, like I'm that the was the midlife scene crisis. Is you yeah. like waking up in some weird house after a, you know, yeah. a banger of a party and, and thinking, man, I, I know where this is heading and I have this other thing. Almost like returning to swimming was almost a defense mechanism to save your life. Is that an extreme? That maybe I'm. I just got goosebumps because I was about to tell, I was yeah. about to say that in a different way. Yeah, so, like, so explain that. Um, and that was the thing. Swimming was the thing that would... W- swimming was like the sobering thought within the haze of the, the life I was living um, and was the thing that pulled me out of... Even, even sometimes like in moments like when you're out, I'm going... It's one or two a.m. Everyone's still going. I have I I remember that I want to do this thing in the future, so I can't like trash my body like this anymore. Mm-hmm. I have to like start. I have to start pulling myself away from these scenarios and this lifestyle. And I remember there were there were many nights sort of before I really put my foot down on my on myself um, that that I would have those moments. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think if I didn't have swimming or or i didn't have the the desire to do that again like i wouldn't have had anything holding me back from just sinking right you know 
just going full force into into that that lifestyle mm -hmm. because there would be nothing else that I would have had, nothing else I would have known. Um, so yeah, in a way, as you say, I think it did save my life. God, I don't know where, what would have happened or where I would have gone beyond that. Um, it was the only thing that, that I think aside from my family, like drew me out of it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad it did. Cause like now, and I'm sure you, you can relate to this, obviously probably not to the sort of extreme perhaps that, that your, where your journey took you, but now I just am as so much more consistently happy on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the highs, the highs aren't as high and maybe the yeah. lows aren't as low, but like I would take this over that any day, I think. And I think even in the future, going back into music, like I'd be very cautious about how I did it and, and, and for what reasons, you know, I'd, I'd probably want to stay based here. I'd go, maybe go, go back and forth to the States, but I don't know if, I think I'd probably want to base myself in Australia and yeah. just do things on my own terms and, and mm -hmm. live a healthy, a healthy life mm -hmm. and have a healthy approach to being an artist as opposed to the kind of destructive artist approach. Yeah. The trope, the cliche, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, you know, but when you're in it, like, yeah, like short of swimming, it is so, it's gotta be so exciting. Doors are swinging open. You're meeting all these people you never thought you would meet. You're, yeah. you know, like you just have this sort of access and, and to say, you know what, I'm, I did that. I don't feel like myself. It's, it's one thing for a, like, even if a normal person, like a, I don't know, like a, you call them sparkies here, like a sparky, right? Like an electrician <laughs> yeah, okay. who's like, you know yeah. what? Like I was good when I was 13, I'm gonna pop in again. Or you're yeah. somebody who's just living a normal life with a normal job and maybe is a little unfulfilled and thinks, you know what? I'm gonna see if I have some more athletic potential inside of me. Mm. That would be an extraordinary story, but the level of, of conviction and discipline that would be required to step away from that super like yeah the peaks are so high right yeah and say i'm not only am i going to walk away from that at least temporarily like i'm going to go do this other thing that means i'm going to be exhausted all the time i'm going to be staring at this black line there's no guarantees of anything this is certainly not like a strategic career move to you know no. to, to like make money or any, you know like it's there's a level of insanity to the whole thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely and i even like i wasn't coming back into it like even financially like I wasn't really set up coming back into swimming like I'd kind of I'd had a few like lean years and was was kind of in a place where I it wasn't like sort of like I'd, I'd probably made some bad financial decisions and had some poor management on that side of things and and you know so it wasn't that wasn't it wasn't like I was going into it going I've got all this cash mm -hmm. and I'm gonna Right. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm sure people I'm, believe th and people think, think that that's that. the case. Like, yeah. oh, you're, you're with this person and you have this and but that, it, that so you wasn't... must be living in a mansion and you yeah. know, have a private driver and like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but for me, like the reality for me at that, in, in that moment, just based on the way things had gone and just, I think, miseducation young about, about money and, um, and just have poor, poor sort of financial management and things for a few years. Like I, I got, I was in a place where it, I wasn't sort of like, yeah, if I go and swim, I'm f f can for sure support myself for right. the next four to six years and royalties whatever, and right? Like it was sort of like, um, I was sort of going into it. I didn't have that kind of security necessarily going into it. And um, and it's it's funny because yeah, people would sort of think, well, if you go and do that, you, you, it's funny the way it's worked out because it's swimming coming back into swimming has sort of had actually almost opened up more opportunities for me outside of swimming. Mm -hmm. Um, partially just because I think people thought it was interesting and wanted to be part of it. Um, and, but, but, go, but beginning that, like I, I didn't know or think that I'd be able to make any money through yeah. it at least for years. Yeah. Um, you know, I just thought I'd be sort of, staring at the black line by myself and right. have no one care about it or just think I was nuts for at yeah. least, I was prepared for that to be the reality for at least like, you know, two to three years mm -hmm. before, 
I also didn't think I'd, I'd, I'd progress as quickly as I did too. Mm-hmm. I was so like, you're I, surprised that I was prepared for like, to be, I was prepared to be shit for like at least two years uh-huh. before like I was anywhere near but where the I willingness to, be. to make that deal. Like that's yeah. super interesting. And yeah. this idea of being out of alignment with like your higher, better self or this vision or this sense of like who you are and how you wanted to like show up in the world mm. being tweaked and, you know, kind of upside down while you're in Los Angeles Yeah, and having enough self-awareness, conviction and courage to correct that and mm. now be in this place where you like who you are, you feel good about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think is, is something that everybody on some level can relate to. Like, I think that there is um, a more self-actualized, authentic version of ourselves within all of us. Yeah. And yeah. every day we're, you know, we're, we're kind of subconsciously wondering how in alignment we are with that person that we wish we were or whatever, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that never ends until we die. Uh, I've certainly gone through, you know, my version of that and yeah. I'm not perfect in that regard, but to have that kind of awareness as a young person and to correct that, I think is exemplary and also puts you in a position to speak to like that subject in general. Like, are we really thinking about what we're doing? Like, what is our intention and how do our actions line up with like the aspirational version of ourself or what is that dormant dream within all of us that maybe we're ignoring or repressing Yeah, because life is fucking hard and we're busy and like just trying to put food on the table is, you know, big enough challenge for, for most people. It's, it's it's so easy. And yeah, it's it's so easy to get stuck in. And I'm not saying everyone should just go and quit their jobs and like become a movie director or whatever, but like, um, it's so easy to, to, totally ignore it in the in the quest for a steady salary or mm-hmm. you know this or that um but when you ignore think, it you get these little knocks yeah hey buddy yeah how you doing in there yeah <laughs> you, know? you good remember me i'm over here like, i'm still here <laughs> yeah. if you want to have a chat and it's know? often that it's often <laughs> like the kid in you right like the child sure, in you the exactly. one that that it's that the childlike follows yeah. instincts and follows impulses mm-hmm. and 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 listens to himself um, rediscovering that I think is important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's something beyond the mind and logic that is childlike and uncorrupted by the difficulties of life mm. that still kind of lives as this seedling inside of us. You yeah, know? it's a good way of um, and, and articulating I think, it. You know, looking at your career and your life, the rear view is always 2020, right? Like when you look backwards, it all makes perfect sense. And yep. when I see yep. your career and the kind of art that you were interested in in cultivating and the way that you expressed yourself as an artist, the theme of swimming is like undeniable. Like it's all about water, mm. you know, like even the subconsciously Prince there. Thing, it's like, it's all about like water and the ocean and, you know, your band was called The Tide. Like it's all like, of course, of course, this guy was going to find his way back to the pool. Yeah, it, it was, was a self fulfilling prophecy, clock, kind right? of. Yeah, self fulfilling prophecy that that was. Yeah, as you say, a ticking clock. Like looking back on it now, it, it all makes sense. But there was a subconscious, mm-hmm. you know, this little subconscious murmur in there the whole time. It was just drawing me back to where I I f- felt most at home or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but talking about that alignment with yourself, I. I now feel, I now truly sort of feel that way. And I think for a few years, I didn't feel that way. And I, and I, I'm so happy I followed it because I, I never thought I'd be able to just sort of sit around and say, I'm, I'm really, even in the midst of grueling training and doing all that stuff, Mm -hmm. like I, it satisfies me. I can, I can sit down in my day and go, yeah, I'm, I'm at peace with myself and, and I'm as happy as I've ever been. And, and I feel like I'm on the path I'm supposed to be on. And sure, it took me a little while to to find it, but um, and I think now I just have learned things. Even if I stopped tomorrow and went back to to playing music full time, I feel like I'd be the kind of the kind of person I'd want to be mm-hmm. going back into playing music full time. I think I'd have the right approach, and I think swimming teaches has taught me that yeah. already. 
Yeah, that's cool. I think that that's, that's sort of the new cool way to be a performer also. Like, yeah, like know. an athlete artist. Right? Well, like yeah, to, it was like we were talking before the podcast and I was going a bit early. Asking you if you knew Mike like Posner, like he's sort of on a similar thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> hey man, I did that other thing. Like, you know, I took yeah. a pill in Ibiza. Like I know that, <laughs> I know that story. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to live that way anymore. And now I want to walk across America and climb Everest and take people on adventures. And yes, I'm still cranking out songs and my songs fucking rule. Yeah. But yeah. I don't have to be that cliche of what you think a performer's life looks like. Hmm. Yeah. I, that's why I admire Jack Johnson so much mm. as well. Um, and why even when I was in LA, I was like, why aren't I doing this the way Jack does it? <laughs> you know, he's, yeah. he, he. Or Donovan Frankenrider. Or Donovan, yeah, who yeah, I've you, had the chance to, yeah, 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 yeah. I've met him. Had the chance to, to play with and, and, and chat to and um, the guys have sort of just forged their own path outside of, like, I don't know if, I, I don't know if Jack's been to the Grammys uh, mm. from memory, like he's never there. Like, and, and whether that is by choice, I don't know. Um, but. Have you met him? Jack, I've met a couple times only briefly, um, but just watching the way he does his thing, um, he's just, I'm sure he had so many opportunities to, to, to go other directions and he's always just stayed yeah. on his own path. I like to path and, you know, mm-hmm. sure his, you know, he had, he was a professional surfer and he has his, an, an accident that sort of redirected him into I suppose creative, you know, more creative path, which has obviously worked out the way it has for him and, mm-hmm. and for the benefit of all of us who like his music. Um, but I, I just admire guys like that and 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 feel like now I have the the sort of confidence and 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 self I have the internal compass to hopefully keep that. Yeah. Keep that head like as when I do that's, go back to so it. So that's what a valuable lesson mm. to learn as a young person. Like mm. maybe you had to have those peak experiences to grapple with that and come to terms with it, but to yeah. be able to have clarity on that at your age creates a foundation for your success and your happiness as you move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I feel so grateful for that because I know it just as easily could have happened when I was 45 instead of 25. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, it's, I or feel, never. Or never. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful that it has happened now. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I'll have more of them in the future. Like I might, yeah. I don't know what kind of cycles I'll go through as I get older and what more I'll learn, but I feel like I've, I've been able to take a lot from my life experience so far, right? which is good. <laughs> you, re-shared yeah. a, you re-shared a tweet the other day. Um, somebody had tweeted uh, like, hey, remember that kid, Cody, that sang songs? Like, this is what he looks like now and he's going for the Olympics and it's a picture of you with your cap and go, you're like, out of, you're climbing out of the pool or something like that and you're looking super jacked. <laughs> <laughs> and you reshared it and you're like, What'd yeah, I that's say? what I'm doing. I don't, I don't remember, but it was sort of like a funny thing. And I, I was thinking about that um, because there's probably a lot of people out there who are fans of your music or maybe were at a time and then haven't thought about you. And yeah. then suddenly they see this and they're like, what the hell is this? Like, I see that on, yeah. especially on Twitter, I see that because I feel like, I don't know why Twitter community is it's that way, but but I'll see that on Twitter a fair bit, whereas somebody that won't have, won't have seen or heard from me in, since, you know, from a moment, mm-hmm. say eight years ago or whatever, and, and they see that I'm now doing this and they kind of think it's, some kind of weird joke or something. Right, or it's just sort of a mind exploder, right? Like, yeah. Because it's so yeah. orthogonal to like people how can't. people think of you. Um, and I think the reason I bring that up is I think there can be a sense in the world publicly that all of this kind of happened with ease or or overnight and, mm. and without a, an appropriate level of appreciation for the courage of making that kind of decision and the amount of work that you have to... Um, put into it. And uh, I think what happens is that a narrative gets crafted that you're just, you're this unbelievably gifted person. It's all easy. You can just write these songs and then, and then you can just go over to the pool and these things happen and it makes you unrelatable. Like you're this outlier, like, like that's cool. And I can be inspired by that, but it's not aspirational because I, you know, I'm not, I'm not like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I was listening to your conversation with Brett Hawk and he was framing it um, in an interesting way um, to disabuse people of that idea and to instead suggest 
this idea that I love and that I believe in, which is that we all are sitting on top of mountains of untapped potential. And the differentiator mm. with you, of course, you have talents that certain we all have everybody does a, talents yeah. and different things. You recognize your talents, you put the work in to, to manifest them. But Brett said that uh, what 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 people should understand is that you understand your potential and you know how to continually tap into that well and go back to it. It's a renewable resource as opposed to the person who maybe taps into it once and does something and says, well, yeah, but I'm out of gas now. Like that was my thing and now I'm right. done. Whereas you're like, no, it's there. It's always there. Like, how do you, how do you dip your toe into that current and, you know, continue to nourish yourself and, you know, with this understanding that uh, there's always more potential to be mined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tapping that source. <laughs> um, so how do you think about that consciously? Does that resonate with you or? Yeah, how does yeah. That and I think it's just, I think cultivating the resilience not to get discouraged by failure as well. I think there was a, there was a moment, my first, I wasn't, I wasn't, as you say, when you, when you think people think it happened overnight or, or whatever, like I wasn't, I was no good when I first got back in the pool, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I just started popping all these good times and training and doing all this stuff. It was like my first race back was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And I was so afraid to do it as well. Like, um, Brett put me in some time trial down with David Marsh's group. It was, I'd probably only been swimming tra i'd probably been training for about three months um at that point and and certainly not hadn't built enough to do a, a good 200 freestyle but he put mm -hmm. me in the 200 free and yeah that, that 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 event doesn't lie i woke up <laughs> yeah i know yeah and he yeah. you know he'd been putting doing giving me all this sprint training and doing all this but at, at the time he he thought that i'd be a 200 swimmer and so he was tra um, trying to start training me in that way and put me in this 200 de long before i was ready to do it and I had so much anxiety about it. Like I woke up the morning of and in this like full body rash, just from, I'd never had any kind of physical manifestation of stress or anxiety before in my life. And I've got this full body rash. I'm wondering what it is. I take myself to the urgent care and I'm trying to figure it out. And eventually I can kind of calm myself down and I go and do the race that night. And it's just horrible. Like, <laughs> and I, I remember I remember coming back that night and sort of thinking, maybe this isn't for me. Mm. What am, am I in over my own head? Like, is this, you have the, that, that, that moment of. You're drinking your own Kool-Aid. Yeah. Yeah. Was I, was I delirious in thinking mm. that this was possible for me? But you know, it's just, is this going to be too hard? And I went, I was so frustrated that night. I think I'm, I think I maxed out on push-ups at like midnight and then mm. went to sleep because <laughs> I had all this like pent up, like, frustration and anger in me and woke up the next day not sure if I was going to keep going mm. um and then I just looked in the mirror and thought you know what I've only given it three months let's give it six and then after six months if I'm still feeling this way if I haven't seen anything else if I haven't seen any 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 improvement or anything I think you got to give it six to yeah and then and then at six months or yeah it was about two and a half months later I got my first um, qualifying time to go and compete at Australian Olympic trials. And that was, so that was my first right. little win. And then it started to snowball from there. there. I'm so glad I saw those mm -hmm. little two month, that two, three month period through. Is, is part of that, like that panic attack response, a function of the fact that, you know, as someone who is a public figure, that whatever you do in the pool is going to get talked about in a yeah. way that isn't going to get talked about if you were just an average person. Oh, right? for sure. So yeah. I mean, I wish the swim swam external didn't. External factors of just who you are that make it different. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing that, you know, I didn't even think about this when I, when I first, when I went and did that little USC time trial where I went 51 short mm -hmm. course yards, like swim swam, I did some article about it. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I wish they, I wish they didn't, because like, I don't you? want that to be there. No, I, no, no, not really. Not my guy Mel, though. No, nah, no, it wasn't trashing, because I think at that point, people just, I think people didn't really know that I was mm. 
you know, swimming or wanted to swim seriously. I was curious that you would even. I think I think people just thought like, oh, that's kind of interesting, and and it's actually not that bad for someone that right did you know. Yeah, if you haven't been training swim. at all, yeah. and you can jump in and pop off a fifty-one. Like, yeah. good on you. Like, if you come, if you go and see, you know, I don't know, Justin Bieber go and just do like some random track, track and field right. meet, and go like, you know, eleven for like a hundred. I know. I mean, like, this is the thing. You'd like, be like, what the hell? When you I'm know? <laughs> describing to other people, like I would talk to my wife and a couple of, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go talk to this guy Cody. You know, uh, and if they haven't um, heard of you or don't know who you are, I'm like, just imagine. It's like, it's like if Justin Bieber was also an Olympic athlete or Sean Mendez or somebody like that, you know? <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. If Sean all of a sudden was like on the Olympic uh, uh, hockey team or something. Mm. I don't know. Not, um, that I, not that I've made the Olympics. <laughs> one of the other things that, that, that you talked about with Brett was this tall poppy thing, like this, this very specific Aussie thing where yeah, we want, we, we love our underdogs. We want our underdogs to win, but then when they win, the relationship shifts a little bit, and it's like, "Don't get too big, buddy." Yeah, you know, we're yeah. quick to cut you down. And I, I was with. Don't win again. I was with. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Don't win again. Yeah, and don't win three times. I, I think it's heightened in Australia, but it's not unique to Australia. I think it's a no. Nah, there's a yeah. there's something human about that. Um, and I was I was with Ned Brockman the other day, who who you know ran across Australia and. He's very famous for his mullets. And, yeah. and what's interesting about the mullet that he rocks is that on the one hand, it's authentically who he is. It's this kid who grew up on a farm and Sparky was an apprentice to become an electrician, like kind of just a bloke, like, yeah. like a blue collar guy. And that's who he is. Yeah. But the other piece of it, I think is very intentional. Like he, he maintains it because he understands that tall poppy phenomenon. Like he mm. wants to make sure everybody understands who he is and that he's true to kind of his roots yeah um, yeah so that uh people are able to kind of meet him where he's at and 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 embrace him but mm. you coming in with everything that happened in la i kind of grew up blah, away blah, blah, from blah. all that yeah like i grew up away um, from the the tall poppy right thing like but I now come you're home in once it a you're year. here and you're in it yeah right like yeah. does that occupy like you contend with that or yes and no i think um i definitely think that well you know, living in LA, like people are a little bit more used to just people wearing whatever. Right. And you, you kind of don't really look twice if, you know, someone's wearing like silver pants or something, you know what I mean? But like here you'd, right. at least in the culture in Australia, like you'd kind of go, so that's, that's yeah. different, you know? I've seen, I've seen Justin Bieber's so, car. Yeah. <laughs> like that yeah. reflective to have like a, like a chrome wrap, like yeah, yeah, Audi R8 I, I or something. Know, like, like, <laughs> Whereas here, people be like, "What the hell?" You know, know. what are you doing, you, you wanker, or whatever? You know, but like, so yeah, it's, it's certainly become more become more conscious of it since moving back. But I feel like I kind of almost needed a bit of that mm-hmm. in my life. You know, over there, it can it, it can right? You, yeah, actually, it was get, healthy, it was healthy for you. To it was have healthy for me to that. to have yeah. that at that yeah, yeah, at, at that, that point. So and and I think now, um, yeah, I've had just enough of a dose of it to sort of just mm-hmm. level me out a little bit. But you're still an underdog. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool. Which is cool. Yeah. I'd like to it's, always it's stay, fun to be stay the, the underdog. Yeah. yeah. And trying to hold on yeah. to the top. Yeah. So you also happen to live with, uh, you cohabitate with your girlfriend, Emma, mm. who just so happens to also be like the most decorated Australian Olympian. Like yeah. she's for real. Yeah. Um, she's so for how real. has like, how has like her experience and obviously she's, you know, somebody who understands mindset, the champion mindset, like mm-hmm. how to achieve goals, all of that. Like, what have you learned from her experience that's allowed you to kind of um, compress your learning curve to getting to where you want to be? Yeah. Being, I guess, being with her and spending so much time with her. Well, we, we first met when she, she was already in the squad that I joined when I came back. So we met then and we always had a, a sort of a connection and a, a magnetism to each other. Something we, we didn't address until, um, after her Olympic feet and when she, she was, she ended up being, staying, being away for another sort of six months after that. And it wasn't until she came back that we sort of connected and and got together um but it was always there from when we first met and um i think i think in a in a 
a good partner, you you recognize a lot of qualities that you yourself, I think, either would like to possess or, or already possess. Um, and I think we we sort of had that with each other. We recognized that we had sort of similar approaches to life and what mm-hmm. we do. And um, and at the same time, I I just saw that. I saw the way she handled everything she she's doing, and um, when we when we first met, like she hadn't yet done what she did last year in to- or in twenty twenty one in Tokyo, and um, but I could see that it was going to happen just by the way she she approached each day, and sort of since I guess being in a relationship with her now and living with her now, I'm I'm inspired by the way she she's probably the most level headed athlete of that of that caliber that I've ever. Mm come across um and how do you account for that like how does she maintain that uh she's extremely one extremely extremely close to her family um extremely grounded and and two i think is never satisfied like it's funny when she just to see her perspective on what she's done like she didn't she doesn't even no, like you ask her how many mm. Olympic medals she's won. Like, she probably knows now that she's heard a lot of other people say it. But I think people, when she did it, she didn't really interesting. realize. Are like, they in the house here somewhere? She, no, they're not here. <laughs> she's got a few other things yeah. around. But um, even last year, like she became the the most um, decorated Commonwealth athlete mm. of all time. Like, not even Australian no, or, all, or all like time. just of any wow. anyone. And then just and being she did, Australian, and she we're finished swimming. The games. I mean, you're like it's like Michael Jordan. I think that's here. true. I, I that I, I'm pretty sure that's the 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 stat. Mm. Um, but she finished the game, and she didn't know that. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, she just sort of has this really interesting approach to to the sport that doesn't sort of involve thinking about accolades or intrinsically or, motivated no, as opposed it, to extrinsically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's so calm through it all as well. Um, so I think it's hard to just, appreciate if you're not Australian, the way that um, your like she's more successful now than, than swimming champions. Yeah, yeah, she's more decorated now than than Ian Thorpe and yeah, that's cool. Susie O'Neill and these people that you know at least you grew up. Yeah, you know, looking at as just the the. That's wild. I mean, I had, I had, um, I'm friends with Michael Klim. So I wake, you know, you wake up and yeah, yeah I don't really think about that <laughs> when, I, when I, I look at her, but Michael Klim shared with me, you know, what it was like. Klim is uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. When, when that was at its peak insanity and, you know, there were just like basically like, you know, 10 story high billboards of, of him and his teammates like on, on skyscrapers in yeah. Sydney. And like it was just, you know, like, so he's not like that anymore here. It's not. Um, I think at least Thorpe at least like the, the way last gasp of that mm, like kind of superstar era. I think so. Like around Athens, mm-hmm. Thorpe who was Thor Ian Thorpe and Grant Hackett and that that era yeah. of, of swimmers. I think I think it sort of was was at its peak, obviously around Sydney Olympics being what it was in Australia and and sort of every athlete that was successful in Sydney Olympics was a absolute megastar. And then I think it's that sort of carried through to say Athens and then beyond that mm-hmm. Australian swimming, I don't think was as, as sort of at the forefront of people's mm-hmm. minds. Or, well, or now whatever. it's on you, buddy. But you, um, had, <laughs> you had, as a, as an Australian patriot to bring yeah. it back, you and Emma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that's changing a little bit and has been changing the last few years um, just with the success that they had and that she had in, in Tokyo and people, you know, it's, it's like in the news again and it's in, in the newspapers and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine what that was like then because those guys were on top of the world at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the idea of making manifest a dream, whether it's a creative dream, an athletic dream, like any, you know, anything, like how do you think about, uh, you know, tackling difficult problems, weathering the challenges and the setbacks that inherently come with that and like kind of staying in the game, like to go from, being like, I could be at any party in LA right now and I'm choosing to stare at a black line. <laughs> like there's a level of like discipline and like self-regulation there that I think is intrinsic to your success. Yeah. Um, maybe that's God gifted, but also I think it's something that you can develop a capacity for. You can develop it, absolutely. Um, and I think I did develop it slowly. I think over a couple of years, like building up the, um, I suppose, 
confidence to to make the changes and sacrifices I made to get back in the pool or to mm. cha change my lifestyle. Um, I think that the the work ethic side of of it for me has always been semi natural the 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 capacity or willingness to i guess quote unquote do whatever it takes um and to prepare for and 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 never 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 like under preparing for anything mm -hmm. always always doing what's necessary um has been something that has come naturally to me i think do what um, others won't yeah mm -hmm. yeah um either it's come naturally to me or i was just sort of taught through my through my youth i guess swimming and then and then everything else sort of how to how to do that mm -hmm. um either way it's in me now uh and i suppose yeah developing the awareness that failure isn't failure really failure or just um information it's information yeah exactly it's information it's it's um you know a, a bad race or a bad session or something is just as important as a good one um and i think just developing the capacity for resilience i think is important but the only way you can do that is by putting yourself in uncomfortable situations or, or forcing yourself to do things that you just didn't or don't think you can do um and i think that was part of what i think Barrett Hawk was really good at with me in the in the beginning was that and he, he talks about it now was that for the first six months he just he said he was just trying to break me all the time <laughs> I remember it was probably only about because if he could break you he could save time and you'll just go back to being yeah. a musician like, let's <laughs> yeah, exactly just hard press him now let's just get this out of the way yeah, yeah. yeah and and he he said he tried and tried so many times and I'd I'd, I'd get out and throw up and then get back in mm just like we had so many moments that early on where I, I had no sort of aerobic fitness or, or capacity for lactate or yeah, any you, of that you stuff. You hadn't been a swimmer long enough to no. develop that base that you no. could tap into So some, the stuff that he was trying to make me do at that time would just make me vomit. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was probably two, three times a week for a while until I was a little fitter. Um, I remember one morning, like I'd, I'd just broken up with my girlfriend the night before. Um, and I come in the next day, I'm, I'm, you know, down and, and whatever. And he, he goes, okay, 200 fly time trial. It's like, what the fuck? You know? And he goes, what if you break up with your girlfriend the night before the Olympics in four mm -hmm. years, and you got to be able to get up and, you know, do this. And just little things like that, that, um, getting so far out of your comfort zone that you, you, you just feel like you're off in the deep end. You know, and then you start to find resilience. your feet. Yeah, it creates yeah. resilience within you. And and um, so I think that's just something I've been slowly developing those building blocks of resilience sort of since I started swimming again. Um, I, yeah, you, sometimes you just sort of just have to jump off the deep end and then find your feet mm -hmm. once you're out there. Um, you're never going to be ready. That's That's what I've realized. You're never going to be ready. Or think you're never gonna feel ready. Sorry, you might. So you might ready, as well train gonna... to do it when you're not ready. Yeah, yeah. And if the stars align and you are ready, great. But you know how to do it when everything's not yeah up the way you wish it would be. Yeah, exactly. And just you just start doing things, and and you know that you know that the first time you do it, you know, for example, say a two hundred fly. When he actually he actually made me do one the very first day he got to LA to train uh -huh. me, and like. It was it was horrible, you know. It was it was the most painful thing <laughs> ever. Um, you got the elephant, and on he your goes, back on that he goes, okay, well, we, he, yeah, oh mate, I could hardly finish it. And he goes, okay, well, we got that out of the way. Like that's the worst it's ever gonna feel. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, that was horrible, but it wasn't. My life's not over. Like it wasn't that bad, you know. Right. He said, well, that's, if that's the worst it's ever gonna feel, that's okay, mm -hmm. you know. And it's just finding, figuring out those unknowns. It's sort of it was developing a mental toolkit. Too. Like if you're, oh, then now I have something to build on. Like it's just yeah. a different lens to like look at where you're at. Yeah. And, look at it and doing something rather than doing something for the first time, no matter how bad it is, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's 
writing your first song or writing your first screenplay or or your first day at a new job or something. Like just do it no matter how shit it is, you know, and the next one will be better and then so on. And before you know it, it's almost like that compound interest th- theory or that like theory that, you know, uh, what's that theory? You, if you double something, every time you double that's it. That's compounding. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So ba- it just starts yeah, to become exponentially. You're, you're, yeah, you're building it with these little micro habits start with over a penny time. And then and you it, get to, you yeah, see it's invisible and, they, and it's yeah. anonymous until one day it isn't. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Are you writing so Like you must be too tired to be writing songs and well now you're in taper maybe you got a little more energy it's so funny that the, my having experienced the way like my creative my creative side or impulses are so dampened by my exhaustion mm. the training like i'll take a break from training like we might get two weeks off for the year or something and then like a couple days into that two weeks all of a sudden i'm just having all Waterfall. these crazy ideas and all these and i'm like why isn't it always like this and I always, and then I remember how tired I am usually all the time. Because um, you're swimming 20,000 yeah. meters a day yeah. or whatever it is. But I'm still, um, I'm still riding. Yeah, I'm still playing. Not, not as much as I would be otherwise. But yeah, mm-hmm. I try not to sort of let that, let that fade too, too much. I'm still sort of compiling ideas and songs and things that I can come back to when I have the time. Yeah, yeah. And I will, I will eventually be starting to play and make music again. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward I, to the day. I'm, I, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. I have no <laughs> doubt, you know, that will come when it's supposed to come. Um, but in the meantime, dude, like honor to talk to you. I'm a fan, um, super supportive of this mission that you're on. I think it takes a lot of courage to, you know, kind of make the moves that you, that you have. And uh, I think there's so much to be learned by the example that you're setting. And I feel like you're, you're showing up in a way that, um, is setting a really positive example for other people and how they kind of think about their own dreams in their own life. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Credit to you. And um, we didn't even talk about Prince Neptune. You're an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've got a garment line. And also there's a, isn't there a documentary out there kind of chronicling your swim? I, yeah. This all came together so quickly that I wasn't able to like see that or. Yeah, no, this, that was, <laughs> um, it's cool having that because that documents the early the very early days of mm-hmm. of me getting back into it, there was a documentary following. It's on Prime Video, mm-hmm. um, doc, documenting or following four different Australian swimmers um, at different stages in their career. Um, Ian Thorpe was one of them, um, and uh, so I was I was in that, and they were sort of documenting the early stages of me making the transition and coming in and. Um, and so that's out there. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. we'll link that up in the show notes. Yeah. Your Cody Simpson. It's called Head, all head Above Water. That, head Above Water. That's called Head it's Above called? Water. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, right on, man. You're going to play a song? Thanks. Come on. Um, if I can have, you're, you're if I can have a second, red, uh, if I can right have now, a second to figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> Young lady lover on the top of the world Can't put my trust in all the things that I've heard Somewhere inside you're still the girl I used to know But I can feel you letting go How's it gonna be? How's it 
Thank you. 